Hi everyone, uh, welcome to our virtual stream processing meetup. Uh, my name is Zefe. Uh, I am from LinkedIn's Kafka team. And my co-host is David, who manages LinkedIn's Samza SRE team. Uh, so we have two exciting talks for you today. Uh, first talk will be given by Beckett from Alibaba. Uh, this talk introduces a project called AI Flow. Uh, AI Flow enables users to define and run workflows containing both batch and stream jobs. The talk will show how AI, can, AI Flow can help the users obtain a global view and overall control of their applications. After that, Ray and Zitting from LinkedIn will talk about auto sizing for stream processing applications at LinkedIn. This work enables a controller to dynamically control applications resource sizing while accounting for diverse functionalities, input load variations, and remote service dependencies to maximize cluster utilization and minimize cost. So here are some uh, FAQs uh, before we begin the talks. Uh, so are the talks recorded? Yes, the talks are recorded and the links uh, for the YouTube uh, video will be posted on the Meetup event site uh, after the event. Another question that we get is, uh, I want to present, whom should I talk to? So there are multiple ways to contact us uh, about uh, presentation requests. Uh, first one is uh, you can post a message on the Meetup site, uh, and then we will follow up uh, with your request. Uh, or you can send a LinkedIn message to either me, uh, Adam F. Genja, or uh, to David Jagoda about your request. Or you can send an email to uh, these uh, email addresses. Uh, another question is, uh, how can I ask questions uh, to the presenters? So for uh, questions, uh, please feel free to post them at any time using the QA uh, section of the Zoom. And uh, at the end of the talks, uh, we will uh, let the presenters answer the questions. And uh, depending on the time, uh, we may cover some remaining questions uh, after all the talks are concluded and we may post them to the Meetup page. Also, uh, we are hiring. Uh, currently, uh, there are a senior SWE, staff SWE, and senior staff SWE roles open. And the uh, links for the uh, applications for these roles are provided in our Meetup site. And uh, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce our first speaker today. Uh, so uh, Beckett uh, is a software engineer leader at Alibaba Group. Uh, he focuses on Apache Flink. And prior to that, uh, Beckett worked at LinkedIn uh, to build uh, streams infrastructures around Apache Kafka. Beckett is an ASF member, PMC member of Apache Flink, and Apache Kafka. And with that, I'll stop sharing and leave it to Beckett. Okay, cool. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, we can. All right, uh, so let's get started. Uh, so yeah, uh, my name is Beckett and today I wanna to talk about a project called AI Flow. Um, and uh, it's basically uh, an event-based workflow that helps you to uh, uh, put everything into a single workflow, including streaming jobs, which is not possible for the current existing workflow projects. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so this is my uh, my self introduction, and I think FA has already put everything um, uh, there, so I just skip uh, skip this page. So uh, today's agenda. So first, I'm going to talk about the AI workflow problem uh, to show you what is the problem of the uh, uh, current existing AI workflow. And then I'm going to introduce uh, uh, AI flow and uh, um, tell you how AI flow addresses these problems. Uh, and finally, I'm going to just give you some current status of the AI flow, workflow, uh, AI flow and uh, our future plan. So, um, Let's start with uh, the problems of uh, uh, the current AI workflow. So workflow is not a new concept. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, existing projects that help you to build a workflow. For example, we have Apache Airflow and we have Azkaban, which is open sourced by LinkedIn. 
um, and uh, um, and also AI flow, AI workflow is not a new uh, concept either. So if you look at uh, Kubaflow, it actually helps you to um, basically construct a workflow that is uh, um, just uh, you know specifically for AI workloads. So, um, however, oh, okay. So let's take a look at a, a, an example of uh, of a workflow in real uh, in, in real world. So this is a typical uh, modern real time recommendation system workflow. So what we have here is that we have uh, this part uh, as the you know computing engine which Flink can take care of, which is uh, feature generation, including the real time feature generation and a static feature generation. And then we have the real-time training sample assembly job here. And we have the real-time model validation here. Uh, so all these parts can actually be fulfilled by uh, Flink as, its comp as a computing engine. Um, and uh, the part in the bottom, this is a part where we do the training work. So also because it's a real-time recommendation system, the training job will be done in two pieces. One is the real-time online training and the second part is offline training. And both of these parts can be done by Flink today also. And we use the project like deep learning on Flink and Flink ML Lib to do that. Um, and uh, apart from that, um, as you can see, apart from the, the, like the rounded rectangle, which represents the, the jobs, we also need to coordinate among those jobs. For example, sometimes you want to run uh, a job uh, to generate static features might be uh, doing some feature backfill or grandfathering. And sometimes, um, you know, when you have the offline training model generated, you want to trigger the model validation job to take that model and start to validate it. And also uh, similarly, when the online training job generates a real-time model, you also want to take the, the model validation uh, up and, uh, and validate the model. And uh, another example is that when I'm doing the real-time training example, uh, training sample assembly, if my training sample before some certain time has already, you know, be ready, then what I want to do is that I want to trigger a job to start the training uh, of the, the samples before that time. So all these like coordinations among the jobs are actually need to be handled by something we call AI workflow. However, as you can see, because this workflow is quite complicated and it, it includes both batch jobs and streaming jobs, uh, the traditional workflow won't work because uh, the traditional workflow relies on the job's finish status to trigger the next job. Um, so in order to solve this problem, we, uh, we developed AI flow to, to address this. Um, and, uh, but as you can see, in this picture, uh, simply uh, having this workflow is still not enough. Uh, we still have a lot of things not covered. Um, basically, as you can see, all the like storage parts are not covered. So the storage part, uh, AI flow won't be able to provide those storage for you. However, what we want to do is that we want to manage the metadata of these uh, storages for you. So we have this metadata service and a model center as a supporting services included in the project of AI flow. So, okay, so this is basically give you a very, like uh, um, very high level view of what AI flow wants to address in the big picture. Um, okay, so, and uh, uh, we used to put these, uh, uh, those two things like deep learning on Flink and AI flow into a project called uh, Flink AI extended. And now we transfer it into a, a Flink community organization called Flink Extended and separate them into two different projects. Okay, so uh, with that example, let's take a look at uh, um, the workflow and uh, let's uh, understand it. So basically a workflow consists of a bunch of uh, nodes and forms a DAG. And uh, here the node actually are jobs and the relation among the nodes uh, we call it finish before relation, basically means that after this job finishes, I want to run the next job. Um, and so uh, today, all the scheduler of the workflow are actually uh, uses job status based scheduling to do the work. Okay, so however, this abstraction actually has a lot of caveats. For example, um, as we mentioned before, streaming jobs are not supported in the workflow 
because streaming jobs never finishes. So the finish before won't work. Um, and also there's no coordination among the jobs in the same workflow. For example, if I wanna say, uh, I don't want to let job two process faster than job one, which means job two should only process events whose timestamp is smaller than watermark of job one, that's impossible. Um, and uh, uh, there's, there are also a lot of unnatural expression of workflow logic. If you are familiar with uh, projects like, like Airflow, if you say, okay, I wanna run a daily job and all, when all the hourly jobs have successfully finished, this is a very simple like uh, workflow statement. However, if you want to achieve this, what you need to do is that you need to probably create two different periodical workflows with different intervals and sort of coordinate among them by yourselves. And finally, um, most workflows right now are actually IO unaware, which means that you can only specify the control relationship between the jobs but where the data of the jobs coming from and where the data of the job are produced to usually are not included in the workflow um, like a picture. So data flow and control flows are usually isolated in this case. Um, so with that problem statement, let's take a look at AI flow and see uh, what, what's our design goals and how can we address them. Um, okay. So uh, our design goals are, are the following. So first of all, we want to have native support for real-time AI. That means we want to support the, the diagram that I showed you of rec a real-time recommendation system with AI flow very easily. Um, and also we want our uh, workflow to be adaptive to various jobs. So you can include simple Python programs, Flink, Spark, uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch jobs in it. And we also want it to be platform agnostic so you can, uh, Run it, run the workflow in uh, Kubernetes or Yarn or cloud services. Um, and also, as we mentioned before, we want to show you both control flow and data flow. So you can have a big picture of the entire workflow. Um, and lastly, sometimes, as you may imagine, the workflows are actually related to each other. So in AI flow, we want to also create this visibility of relations between workflows instead of treating them as individual workflows. Okay, so and that in order to achieve that, we basically need a global view of control flows from event senders and receivers. So how can we achieve that? So uh, this is a, a very basic, like a key abstraction called event-based scheduling or event-based workflow. So the idea is that instead of treating the relation in the workflow as finished before relationship, we say, okay, the relation between the jobs in the workflow should be event-driven conditions. So what does that mean? That means that we, we think of the workflow or the entire system as the following. We think that in the system, there are a lot of events happening. And uh, these events, uh, when you combine them together, they may meet some kind of conditions and these conditions are predefined. So once these predefined conditions are met, you want the system to take some actions. And this action might be taken by the scheduler and this action might be taken uh, by the jobs in this workflow or the system also. So this events to condition to action uh, chain basically forms our abstraction uh, of the event-based workflow. So, so what exactly does that mean? So basically um, uh, what we do is that we want to we want first abstract out the, the workflow into, into um, so, so here I'm just going to tell you how AI flow um, abstract the, the workflow, how we treat the workflows and manage them. So first at the top level, we have a, a concept called a project. A project has one or more workflows and a workflow has one or more jobs. Uh, a workflow execution is a running instance of a workflow. So that's the basically the hierarchy of the project workflow job and the workflow execution. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, because we are saying that AI flow is actually an event-based workflow. So the, the very key abstraction would call events. And here's our abstraction for events. So there are a lot of uh, fields here. First, we have the, the field called key. And that's basically tell you the entity that events is associated with. So in this case, the example tells you this key is uh, about, this, this event is about ads click model. Um, and the value is usually um, telling you the, the key information about this event. 
So here we here this is basically the the path of the model uh, where it's saved, and the event type tells you what it, what what kind of events this uh, this event is, um, and the version is kind of uh, it is just a sequence number basically, um, and we have the create time and the context. So the context is basically a user defined field to carry more information, and sometimes we also use it to isolate different um, like workflow executions. And uh, also there's a namespace. So the namespace is for event isolation across projects. And finally, we have the sender uh, field here. So the sender field allows us uh, to, chain the, uh, to chain the entire control flow together. So you know, um, you know which job is depending on which job. Okay, so this is the key abstraction of events. And uh, uh, with events, we also have event subscribers. As we mentioned before, um, in our abstraction, uh, there are two different types of entities that might take action. One is the scheduler itself. So the, the scheduler basically subscribe to all the events and define in the rela job relations and take actions like start job, uh, uh, stop a job or restart a job. And the user jobs can also subscribe to events and uh, um, they can take actions when the conditions are met. Okay, um, and in order to let the, let the scheduler to do something, we introduced two different like API. One is called action on events. So this is basically the, the events condition and action chain, uh, how you express It looks like uh, there has been a disconnection. Uh, speak, our speaker is reconnecting. Oh, he's come back, yeah. Yep. Yep. Beckett, I think you might be on mute. Oh, uh, sorry. I, I think I just, uh, <laughs> I just uh, went offline somehow. Uh, can you still see my screen or I should uh, reshare it? Uh, please reshare. Okay. All right. Uh, sorry, I should probably go a few slides back, I guess. So um, when I dropped, I, I was talking about these slides, right? That's right, yep. Oh, okay, so yeah, so basically um, we, as we mentioned before, um, instead of, uh, or in addition to the job status change, uh, that triggers some action. We also introduce a new mechanism that events can trigger actions. So uh, we basically have two ways to express the relationship between jobs. One is called action on events. So you tell us which job you wanted the action to, to be uh, taken upon. And you tell us what conditions should be met uh, to take that action. Um, and the second uh, interface is basically uh, like the traditional job status change event. However, uh, in addition to the, the traditional workflow, which you can only do something when the job finishes, we allow you to specify the job status. Um, basically, you can say, okay, uh, you, you can, by default, it's going to be like, uh, um, do something after the job finishes. However, you can also say, I wanna do something after the job starts or, or, or become running or failed. So basically uh, it extends the job status um, to action uh, a little bit more than the traditional workflow. So, and the event condition is one of the following. Uh, it's either meet all events or meet any events. Uh, and we plan to extend it furthermore to just provide an event handler, uh, which takes in a bunch of events, then return a, a job action. Um, uh, but that's not there yet. And uh, that's our plan to, to do it in a few releases. Uh, okay. And uh, with that, let's take a look at the architecture of AI flow. So uh, AI flow has a few uh, key components. So at the very uh, like a center of the, of the project, we have a workflow SDK and a workflow scheduler. And, and in addition to that, we also have a few supporting services, including metadata services uh, and model center and the notification service. 
Um, and uh, so let's take a look at what are they. So metadata service. So metadata service basically uh, helps us to manage the metadata that is related to a workflow. That includes the data set information, the project information, uh, the workflow and job information, the model lineage basically tells you um, from which workflow execution uh, the model was generated. And it also um, has artifacts, which allows user to put a bunch of uh, user defined dependencies uh, into, into this uh, uh, metadata center. Um, and also we have a notification service and the notification service is basically um, providing the, 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 the fundamental mechanism for people to pass events around. So the way it works is very simple. Basically people, uh, the subscriber can listen to a notification service with a particular key. Um, and uh, when uh, someone updates that event with the key, um, the, the listener will receive these new events with all the information in it and take action upon it. So uh, yeah, so this is a very uh, simple abstraction and the way, uh, and, and we introduced this one just to allow people to pass around events in the system. Uh, and also we have the model center uh, because this is AI flow and we designed it uh, initially to cater to the uh, AI scenario. So we have the model center there to help people manage their models. Um, that includes uh, ver model versioning and model parameters, metrics, lifecycle management, uh, and also visualization. So the model center part is uh, um, uh, is still uh, still under in, uh, construction, and uh, uh, I think the visualization part is not that good yet. Um, but I think the other parts should be there already. Yeah. So uh, this is architectural overview when we put everything together. So um, so the 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 parts above this dot line is uh, the define and compile part. Uh, that is done by the AI Flow SDK, and uh, the part underneath this uh, dot line is uh, um, execute part, which means it runs the workflow. So let's take a look at each part one by one. Uh, so first part, uh, when we look at AI uh, Flow SDK, people should use uh, should first define an AI graph. Uh, the AI graph consists of AI nodes and relations, and also uh, configs and dependencies of each of the nodes. So uh, let's take a look at an example. So for example, I can define an AI graph like this. And in this graph, um, I have these uh, uh, like black lines between the AI nodes. Um, and uh, I also have uh, um, the red lines between the AI nodes. So the AI nodes here uh, are basically logical processing unit. Um, uh, for example, here example, uh, it's basically uh, re uh, reading some data from external sources and the trans uh, join them together and transform and then put them into a train, uh, uh, into a train node to train the, the, the samples. Um, and uh, so uh, here, uh, the, the red line are control dependencies or control edges. The red line actually separates different jobs apart. So that means in this AI graph, we actually have three jobs eventually. And the first job consists of, the, of the, the, this part, which is going to be a training job. And the second part consists of the middle two nodes, and that's the validation job. And lastly, we have the bottom part consists of the example for an inference, that's the inference job. So, um, so this is the AI graph. And uh, as we mentioned, AI nodes are named the logical processing unit with multiple inputs and outputs. And uh, the AI nodes are going to be interpreted by a component called job generator that we will see shortly. Um, and uh, there are relations between AI nodes and the relation between AI nodes are, are, are of two types. The first type, we call it data dependency and that's inter-job dependency. And the data basically flows uh, from one AI node to another AI node and uh, the data dependency are, uh, are going to be interpreted by the job generators as well. Um, and uh, the second part is the control dependency, which is the red line between those uh, AI nodes. And that part is going to divide the jobs. So it's going to, uh, this, so this dependency basically are inter-job dependencies. And uh, uh, the event-driven control flows are going to be interpreted by the scheduler. So let's take a look at uh, the, the second part. After we have this uh, uh, AI graph generated, we're going to pass it to the job tra translator. Um, within there, we can see the job generator. 
so the AI graph, the job, gen, the job translator actually, uh, the job translator is responsible for translate the AI graph into uh, the workflow. And more specifically, it does two things. One is to split the AI graph into subgraphs. And secondly, it translates the AI subgraphs into jobs. So let's take a look at the example again. So here, as we mentioned before, um, the, the, the AI graph will going to, are going to be divided into three different jobs. The first one is the training job, and the second one is validation job, and the last one is inference job. And uh, uh, this is, depends on the, on the red line here, that's control dependency. Um, and, uh, uh, and after that, uh, we will have a workflow here. So uh, we have uh, the nodes becoming jobs and the relations become like the dependencies among the jobs. Okay. Uh, and after that, we will have a workflow and that's going to be passed into the AI flow client. And the AI flow client is responsible for uh, trans transforming the workflow into an executable workflow. More specifically, it's going to be uh, it's going to upload all the code and dependencies to some external storage, and then upload the workflow with URI. So uh, let's take a look at the, uh, this example again. So here, uh, what uh, this part is going to do is that it's going to uh, upload all the executables and dependencies into a remote store, be it HDFS or uh, some S3, uh, some remote store. And then it's going to update the job config with this URI. And that becomes an executable workflow. So, um, and uh, after that, the SDK finishes its job and it's going to submit the executable workflow uh, to the AI flow service. Uh, and the AI flow service is responsible for scheduling the jobs and submit jobs uh, to different platforms. Uh, so let's take a look at how it works. Um, still, the, the previous uh, like uh, 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 graph, let's take a look how it uh, actually works in the runtime. So first, the scheduler will um, update the metadata service with job status. Maybe it's a pending running. And then it's going to uh, take a look at what job can be run. And then it find, OK, job one, which is the training job, can run. And so let's assume this time we use the Kubernetes cluster to run the jobs. So the AI flow uh, service will basically use a job submitter to submit the first job. And uh, this is the training job. And after it's uh, become running, the job status change will be reported back. Right, uh, back it uh, will be reconnecting. Like it is back. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I think I <laughs> the connection is quite unstable. Uh, I I lost my connection again. Uh, okay, let's uh, resume. Oh, where's my slides? Okay. Uh, uh, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay. But uh, can you do a full screen? Yeah, sure. Perfect. Okay, all right. So uh, I think I lost connection when I'm talking about this slide. So basically uh, the, the AI flow service will send me the job to uh, the Kubernetes cluster and update the job status in the metadata service again. And let's assume this is a training job here, right? So uh, let's assume this is a, a streaming training job. 
So it uh, runs and generates a model and it's going to register a model uh, version to the model center. Then the model center will send a model version registration event to the notification service. Um, and uh, the scheduler will subscribe it to the notification service about this event. Um, and then once it receives this event, it take look, uh, takes a look at the workflow and check the conditions and see which conditions is met. Um, and in this case, it finds, okay, once uh, a model registration event, model version registration event was received, it should trigger a validation job. So it will trigger job two here, which is going to validate the, the model uh, generated by job one. Um, and uh, let's assume this job is a batch job that it validates the model. So it runs and the model has been validated um, and then it, it just uh, exit. And the model center in this case has received a model validated, uh, uh, a validated model uh, request from, uh, from the, the job two. And it will then send the message again to the notification service. Uh, it's called a model validated event. And then after that, the scheduler knows, okay, once the model validated event was sent, I'm going to bring up job three or update job three. And in this case, job three will be brought up and it's going to look at the model center for the latest uh, validated model version and just uh, load it and start the, uh, the inference. Uh, and because it's a streaming job, so it's going to run, keep running. The job one is going to keep running and uh, generate a new model. And then uh, the entire cycle will go through again, right? So we have model version registration event, then we have model validation event. Um, and let's assume this time the model validation uh, passed again. So um, the entire uh, the entire flow will, will go again. And uh, there will be a second model validated event sent by the model center to the notification service. And in this case, the inference job here will also subscribe to the notification service uh, for that event. So it knows that uh, a, a new model has been validated, then it's going to load the new model version again from the model center. And the scheduler in this case won't do anything because it sees that the inference job is already running. Um, Okay, so this basically uh, shows you how uh, the how AI flow can actually deal with complicated workflows um, that cannot be achieved with a traditional workflow, um, and uh, that is uh, uh, based on the the event based uh, workflow. Okay, then uh, I'm going to talk about the pluggability and migration paths of uh, AI flow. So in AI flow, there are a few parts that can be pluggable. The first one is jo called job plugin. As we mentioned before, we want AI flow to support different kinds of jobs. So uh, right now we have some built-in implementations that we have already supported Flink and Python jobs and also the bash scripts. And uh, some of our users have already implemented support for TensorFlow and Spark. Um, and uh, uh, to our experience, this is actually quite simple. So for example, the Flink job plugin has only 600 lines of code in total. So it should be done very easily. Uh, and the second pluggable is uh, Blob Manager, which means that you use to upload and download the job dependencies. Uh, right now we have uh, the built-in implementations, including HDFS and Alibaba Cloud OSS, which is the uh, object storage. And uh, uh, we also support local file systems. And uh, uh, it's not a, a difficult to implement your own Blob Manager either. Uh, and finally, we have a part called scheduler that can also be pluggable. Right now, the default scheduler we're using is a modified version of uh, Apache Airflow. Uh, we added the capability of event-based scheduling in, into it. Um, however, we imagine that uh, people can also, um, you know, put Azkaban or Argo Flow uh, as a scheduler for AI Flow, uh, as long as the semantic of event-based scheduling can be met. Uh, and also, uh, uh, when we talk about migration paths, usually people have this question, if I'm using currently using Airflow, how can I migrate to AI flow? Uh, and here's how usually it works. So you have your existing workflow here. And what you do is that you first register jobs and relations with dummy job plugins uh, in AI flow. So you will have a, a basically read only workflow here. It doesn't do anything, but it allows you to have an overview of all the, the entire workflow in, uh, in, in your system. And then after that, uh, you can yeah, read and view the job status of the running jobs. And uh, um, after a while, you can choose to migrate a part of your workflow into the entire uh, AI, AI flow here. 
So this is how people usually migrate their, their workflow from existing AR flow uh, to AI flow. Um, and uh, there are a few use cases uh, uh, that AI flow uh, we're going to uh, build in. So one possible uh, use case is uh, for online feature engineering every handling. For example, in our real-time uh, recommendation uh, system, in your training and evaluation part, it's possible that you find uh, due to some data problem, your, your model get polluted. So the, 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 if, uh, basically the, um, the, the accuracy of the model becomes a start to drop. And in, in this case, what you want to do is that you want to roll back your model to the previous unpolluted version. And then you skip over the part of data that has problem and then start your training again. So in this case, <clears throat> what you can do is that you can have a built-in workflow help you to do that. Um, and also there's a feature backfill workflow. That is a very like commonly seen workflow. Uh, that means um, I have an existing uh, machine learning application and I want to add a new feature to my application. I want to add this feature to my historical data as well as my streaming data. So in this case, uh, you can trigger a new streaming job for the feature backfill and run through the historical data and switch over the, to, to the master queue. And uh, once this job catches up to, uh, to the present, uh, what you, you can do is that you can seamlessly shut down the old feature generation job when the new job catches up. Uh, and we're going to, we, we actually see a lot of more built-in airflow workflows that we can uh, provide and we're going to add them gradually. Uh, okay, finally, so here are the current status and a future plan of AI flow. Uh, so uh, currently we have, well, we're, we already have a few users uh, that is using AI flow in their production, uh, that including Bilibili and uh, some other uh, uh, you know, Chinese companies. Uh, and okay, the last one actually is a Japanese company. Uh, so we already have a few users and uh, uh, currently we, uh, we start, our first release was on August to the 31st. Uh, this year, uh, and uh, in uh, uh, a month later, we released 0.2, and we have full Airflow compatibility support, and we supported distributed executors, and we provided an AI flow UI, uh, and we plan to release uh, 0.3 this week, uh, and uh, and we're going to add uh, the command line tool chain, and we're going to provide a seamless version upgrade and downgrade capability across the AI flow versions. Um, and in the future version uh, uh, 0 0.4, our roadmap here uh, actually says it's going to have a full HA support. Uh, so you can, um, you, can, you can run AI flow in your production without worrying about um, what if uh, a particular machine gets down. Uh, yeah. So, okay, with that, that concludes my today's talk. And uh, oh, so this is an open source project. Uh, and uh, the, you can find the, the project here. Uh, it's in the Flink Extended Organization, which is an organization created to host the projects in the Flink ecosystem. Uh, however, we believe AI Flow can actually uh, do much work beyond uh, Flink. So it can actually be a quite generic event-based workflow tool uh, for people to construct their workflow that including streaming jobs and chain everything up. Uh, to have a global view of their applications. All right, so yeah, so that's uh, all about my today's talk. And uh, uh, okay, I think I already used all the 40 minutes. <laughs> so, but I guess uh, maybe we can take uh, uh, one or two questions maybe. Yeah, Beckett, I don't know if you can see in the chat, but there's a couple of questions that have already come in. I, I can uh, oh. call them out to you if you want, or if it's easier for you to read them yourself, uh, let me know. Okay. Uh, how does the validation job be triggered by the job status update? Oh, okay. So Epan's question. So uh, it's actually not triggered by the job status update. It's actually triggered by the uh, model validated, uh, model generated event. So uh, I think the question is about uh, the example slides here. So uh, yeah. So as you can see the the validation job here is actually not triggered by the job status change of job one. Instead, it's actually triggered by the model validation event here. Uh, and the scheduler receives the model validated events, then looks at conditions 
uh, and found once this event was, was received, it should uh, trigger the, the validation job. Um, and for inter-job scheduling, we can use data availability condition to trigger the next job in the pipeline. What's the pros and cons you see using? Uh, okay. Yeah, so the problem here is that uh, um, the data availability condition, the data availability condition in the current workflow, it is actually a good uh, uh, alternative. However, the problem is that uh, uh, usually this needs to be in the pool mode. Basically, you need to have somebody uh, trying uh, to you know pull the pull the data again and again to ensure it's ready. And if something happens uh, in the in the upstream, um, then the 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 basically the subsequent uh, polling jobs will not know about it and it will eventually time out and your pipeline will become in a very like weird situation that where you see a lot of uh, subsequent jobs and workflows are brought up but cannot run and failed all the time. So um, I would say it depends on, on your use case. Um, so if uh, if the data availability condition with the polling mode uh, works fine for you, then I think it's okay. Yeah. I think there's one more question. It looks like I might have uh, rolled off the end of the scroll, but uh, also for me, uh, for AI okay. flow, yeah, for AI flow event definition, it seems that events can be defined with a general and broader meaning, including the job status change. What's the specific reason to define job status change differently from other events? Uh, this is just for backwards incompatible uh, backwards compatibility. So people are familiar with uh, uh, the, the the job status change uh, API. So this is like a syntax sugar. So yeah, that's that's the only reason we we have two uh, API. So theoretically speaking, yes, you can just use the event based uh, API to do the work. Uh, let's see where is it. Yeah, this one. So yes, theoretically speaking, you can uh, actually just uh, have the first API, and you specify the event condition to look at events called job finished event, and you put the job name of the previous jobs there. That's also do the same work. However, uh, the second interface is just for a syntax sugar. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? All right, maybe we'll, uh, I guess if people have more questions, please post them in the chat. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks everyone. And uh, sorry for keeping dropping offline. <laughs> Thanks for uh, sticking with us and recovering. That was uh, uh, much appreciated. Thank you, Beckett. Thanks. Yep. I'm just going to stop sharing. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, I'd like to, uh, hi, I'm Dave Goda. I'd like to introduce uh, our next speakers. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Ziting and Raymond, who are software developers working on the LinkedIn stream processing team. I'm going to tell you about some of the software that they've built. And um, in particular, I, I work on site reliability engineering. So in particular, this has made, helped make our systems easier to operate, which is a, a potentially a chance for me to mention that we're also hiring for various site reliability engineering roles at LinkedIn. Uh, so without uh, further ado, uh, Ray and Zinter. All right, uh, yeah, let me share. Uh, can everybody see my slides? Yeah, it looks good. good. Yeah. All right, perfect. All right, so yeah, I'm Raymond. I work with Zeting, uh, Fan, uh, Bharat, Pratik, uh, Renu, and Kartik, and a few other folks. Um, this is a project called Autosizing for Streaming or Autosizing for uh, Samsung at LinkedIn. Um, this is a system that we build that has helped us to cut our resource use, uh, cut down on resource wastage, and remove the need to do any kind of manual tuning on jobs, uh, which would typically otherwise take uh, anywhere from sometimes a few minutes to a few hours to two days. Um, but yeah, the story is fairly simple. Um, everybody's doing stream processing. We're doing stream processing. Um, there's SAMSA, Flink, Storm, Heron, all kinds of stream processing systems available uh, to run streaming computations. 
uh, SAMHSA is LinkedIn's homegrown stream processing system. Um, and you know, you'd use one of these pretty much anytime you would require real-time output in a real-time or a near real-time fashion. Um, all kinds of applications, uh, including uh, notifications, activity tracking, classification, site speed, um, analyzing call graphs on the website, um, updating indices and so on. Um, overall, everything better today, uh, the SAMHSA team at LinkedIn run more than 5,000 different computations uh, running hundreds of millions of messages per second, thousands of gigabytes a second mess, uh, in terms of rate. Um, and the way we kind of operate is uh, we provide stream processing as a service. Uh, so what that means is we have SDKs uh, that allow users to write uh, stream processing apps in Java, Python, SQL, and so on. Um, and we bear the onus of running those jobs on our clusters, uh, managing its operation, security, privacy, scalability, fault tolerance, uh, everything. Um, and so then the problem is users want their jobs to have the required throughput and latency, um, but at the same time are faced with adjusting, tuning a number of resource related configs and parameters uh, ranging from how much memory their job should have to CPU, to number of threads, uh, whether or not their jobs should use SSDs versus uh, hard drives or specialized hardware um, and so on. And so this typically leads to two kinds of problems. Users either vastly over provision um, by our estimates, almost half the users provision over provision by at least 50%. Um, a recent paper from Google had pretty much similar findings or on the flip side, users uh, under provision, which means their jobs uh, in production uh, often running out of memory, they're either stall, fail, or uh, they underperform, leading to high latency, low throughput. Um, and what I mean by adjusting parameters, uh, in, in the case of SAMSA specifically, what this means is um, things like the size of uh, your average processing uh, container. So a job in SAMSA is a set of more containers. A container is nothing but a JVM. Uh, and so now you are uh, faced with the, if you're a job owner, you're faced with the decision of, um, how big should my container be? How many containers should I have processing for my job? What should be the heap versus native memory allocation be? Uh, how many, uh, what should be the CPU sizing or uh, vCore sizing for your job? Um, and then um, furthermore, in terms of tuning parameters, you could have you know, specific thread pool sizes that you might wanna tune. Um, all kind of depends on which cluster manager you use. Some of them aren't specific, but uh, a lot of them just apply broadly. Um, and so, what we want therefore basically is a controller that takes as input the throughput and latency goal uh, for a job or for a user, um, the input load at any time, the internal information about the, the application, uh, perhaps environmental conditions such as network latencies, um, condition of the dependent services that a given job is uh, contacting um, and basically controls the size or adjusts the size uh, depending on those. Um, and so, Essentially, that being our solution direction, um, we first wanted to take a look at what are some existing solutions out there to kind of try to solve the problem. Uh, so when we looked at that, uh, looked at existing systems, looked at research systems, basically two kinds of broad level uh, categorization. Um, one uh, is basically a sort of a black box approach where you uh, assume that you don't know much anything about the stream processing application itself. Um, you Formula you you know define rules for controlling each uh, uh, sort of uh, aspect in terms of memory, CPU, and so on, and then um, you know, let the system run. So this is very similar to how you would get um, Azure BMSS scaling or EC2 auto scale or Dalian kind of uh, approach. Um, the other uh, end of the spectrum is sort of your optimization based approaches. Um, these uh, mostly are comprised of two parts. Either they are ones that assume that your stream processing application is a DAG, um, which means uh, it just combines well-known operators, cataloged operators such as filters, joins, maps, um, or uh, it makes some assumptions on the workload themselves. So it assumes that the workload is of certain type and then based on that, it uh, uses notions from say queuing theory or hill climb algorithms to uh, sort of control sizing. Uh, so what we did was we compared the approaches with our prod jobs to check if these assumptions are valid. Uh, what would be the problems if uh, faced if we were to apply these uh, in production and what insights that we can draw from that, uh, which would then sort of pose as challenges 
that uh, if, if we're trying to build a controller, it should presumably address those challenges. Um, so I've tried to kind of sort of categorize them into three parts. So first one essentially uh, is the fact that uh, applications are not just DAGs of these nice well-defined cataloged operators. Uh, they use all kinds of additional functionalities today. Um, it ranges from maintaining or side loading and external frameworks like TensorFlow, uh, sometimes doing out of order or wanting to do out of order processing, uh, defining priorities on input, uh, using external uh, but localized state. So this is basically, they would use a uh, state that is uh, stored locally in say a RocksDB store, but also backed up to an external KV store or a blob store. And um, at the same time, users may have jobs that talk to web services, have custom user-defined functions, uh, perhaps even want to control when their input is checkpointed and so on. Um, and uh, this is to maybe show you an example. If you look at the spectrum of apps in running in our clusters and uh, sort of try to uh, shade up all the different features and all the different aspects that they customize, um, as you can see, the scatter graph is all pretty much lit up everywhere because uh, the, the, the the application's functionality is very, very heterogeneous. Um, the other second challenge that comes up is the fact that applications also use remote services. Uh, what that means is that a stream processing applications, service time, throughput, and latency, therefore, doesn't depend just on how fast it can go, but also on um, the latency, error, retry rate, and network latencies of the remote service it's talking to. Uh, and here, Pretty much what we see is basically there's no specific distribution of service times uh, across our jobs. It's a sort of a long tail distribution. Um, so you'll have jobs that are, <coughs> excuse me, you'll have jobs that are um, you know, very localized in terms of their service time distribution and then some that are sort of very long tail. So there's basically no common pattern, uh, which voids most of the assumptions that sort of the optimization based approaches make. Um, and so, yeah, so this is the point I was mentioning earlier, like throughput of the job then depends not only just the input load variation, but also the, the performance and the throughput of the remote service. Um, similarly, if you just look at input across uh, our clusters, there's no specific distribution of arrival rates. Um, it will pretty much uh, be a very heterogeneous kind of behavior. Um, and that's sort of the same is true for all kinds of app characteristics. So if you look at the median uh, service time of an, of an application, the number of inputs it receives, um, that pretty much all uh, kind of a long tail, um, uh, which means you can actually make assumptions based on um, such characteristics. Um, and then third, most importantly is um, stream processing applications operate continuously, but under variable load. Uh, what that means is they have correlated, they develop correlations in their resource use. So for example, if uh, a running application would have CPU bottleneck, that would typically mean that um, because it is processing so slower than the input, it would have buffering of its input, which would mean higher memory use, which would mean higher GC, um, and that would mean higher latency and low throughput. Um, and what is true specifically for Java-based systems or apps such as Samsung and Flink is, uh, typically, even if you have a memory bottleneck, that'll again lead to higher DC, low throughput, high latency. Um, and then the process would spend more time uh, running the GC and therefore uh, go over in terms of security utilization. Um, and so given these challenges in this situation, we can kind of try to come up with a set of requirements that our controller should kind of address. One was obviously uh, we want a controller to sort of right size the jobs. Uh, what that means therefore is we're not necessarily looking for the optimal size, but a size which keeps the oversizing bounded and controllable perhaps, um, but yet avoiding under provisioning and avoiding uh, and, and keeping the over provisioning bounded, not necessarily the optimal size for that job at that instant. Um, at the same time, what we want is our controller to take actions that are interpretable. Uh, we don't want it to rely on optimization problems that it's solving and making random decisions whether or not interpretable and explainable to any operator. Uh, that is kind of key to running any large scale uh, system because at the end of the day, an on-common operator needs to be able to do, uh, to, to reason about why a given action was taken. Um, and more importantly, we don't want our controller uh, in its um, goal of trying to find the right size. Uh, we don't want it to uh, make unsafe actions, which means we want it to err on the side of caution and take uh, perhaps oversizing decisions rather than undersizing decisions. 
Um, and then, yeah, at the same time, we want our controller to minimize the time taken to right size a job. Like, ideally, don't want it to take forever. Um, and of course, uh, you have the good uh, goals of making your controller scalable, fault tolerant, resource efficient, uh, and so on. Um, but yeah, comparing these requirements to the existing systems, uh, pretty much you either get one or the two. Um, maybe you either get a, you get interpretable right sizing, but then you can get uh, high time taken for the right sizing, you get oscillations, um, or on the other extreme, you uh, either depend and make assumptions about the workload itself, um, the application itself, um, but then you circumvent uh, interpretability, uh, support for job and our services, um, but yeah, you do get the optimal size and minimize the time taken. Um, so given this, what we try to do is come up with an approach that is sort of midway between the two, um, sort of a gray box approach, which makes some assumptions about the job based on the fact that it is a stream processing job, but not a whole lot. Um, so yeah, so that's pretty much our uh, simple feedback loop uh, auto sizing system called Sage. Um, and so the way this works is um, essentially underlying has a policy based system a policy is nothing but a logic or a set of, uh, uh, of classes or a set of lines that are encapsulating or sizing or tuning a logic for a given resource. So either memory or heap memory or native memory, CPU or parallelization, but just a specific single one. Um, and then what we've done is we figured out a priority order in which we uh, apply these policies to every job periodically on all the jobs. Um, and we've added additional rules to uh, sort of control how many such actions uh, get applied in parallel. Um, and sort of the benefit of this is A, it gives us deterministic uh, determinism, which means no matter what job the auto sizing is being applied to, it will always do the same sizing decision, the same order on any job, uh, which kind of makes running and operating and reasoning about things a, a lot easier. Um, it all, um, and what that also means is since policies are now just controlling a specific resource, they're very easy to write. Um, the ordering takes care of how they combine and interleave with each other, which we uh, sort of sit down and and, uh, and, and and formulate it, but writing a policy and tuning it by itself is, is fairly easy. Um, and moreover, this gives us sort of an understandable invariant for every action um, because, that, because a given policy just encapsulates a specific uh, uh, resource. Um, and so this is sort of the order in which uh, we've uh, tailored uh, uh, this ordering for SAMSA and Flink, or basically standing query systems like SAMSA. I'll uh, go over um, you know, these and why does this ordering make sense, perhaps with an example. Um, so consider, for example, say you have a straggling app, which means um, job is consuming input, it's not keeping up, uh, it is uh, sort of stalling. Um, and so here, what we tried to do is we figured that um, in that case, should you increase memory or CPU or parallelism? Uh, in that case, what we thought, uh, what we actually realized is increasing CPU or increasing memory is actually more, uh, more beneficial than increasing CPU. Uh, that's because most um, continuous operator systems like Samsung Flink are, have bounded buffers, which means if you give them enough memory, they will stabilize uh, regardless of the throughput they give you. Uh, so which means you can actually stabilize the job in which case it's not actively stalling or failing. It's just that it's, it's throughput is not matching input, right? Um, similarly, um, uh, between controlling the parallelism and the CPU allocation, uh, the insight here is that um, incre increasing memory, uh, increasing CPU and memory before parallelism uh, rules out any resource bottleneck in, the, in, the, in sustaining the job's current level of parallelism or throughput which means if the current parallelism uh, hypothetically was say X, uh, we know that the memory and CPU allocation because of the priority order are enough to sustain that level. Um, and yeah, and then the policies themselves can rely on any kind of signals regardless of the specific resource. Um, and yeah, uh, so essentially like uh, basically for memory and CPU, because, the, because uh, of systems like Samsung Flink, they use bounded buffers, and typically memory is the dominant resource for most of our workloads. Um, and that's, that's why for scale up kind of makes sense for us. Um, and then the other thing is that uh, for scaling down parallelism, um, it makes sense to, for us to do it immediately after scaling up to the required level. Um, this has the added advantage that for brand new jobs, um, 
because the scale down is likely to free up resources, having this higher priority uh, than a heap or a parallelism scale down means that uh, your scale down actions have to run only once and reclaim the resources after you've tuned the parallelism to the required level. Uh, similarly, scaling down heap memory before uh, CPU uh, makes sense because a uh, heap decrease can increase CPU demands. So current CPU, so the thinking here is that current CPU allocation can obviously suffice for the current heap and therefore having a CPU scale down uh, later makes sense, uh, but because that would actually uh, optimize away the number of steps uh, taken for the sizing. Uh, moreover, what Java will typically do is it will naturally optimize the heap on a long running process at the cost of increased CPU. Uh, so therefore, if we had CPU scale down before, uh, we would again cause an additional scale up and scale down step, right? Um, and lastly, yeah, the tuning between uh, P5 and P6, which is heap and total memory, can be kind of in any order. Um, we choose heap and total memory. Uh, we chose heap before total memory, uh, so that the subsequent total memory uh, scale down essentially does one uh, sweep and reclaims not just the heap memory but also the total memory. Um, uh, we also do some yarn specific optimizations here, which is uh, because we choose total memory before CPU, that is P6 and P7, um, it kind of helps us to uh, fix up on the container count, which is the JVM count for a job before we change its, uh, so we, before we change its CPU allocation. So that's just uh, somewhat easier for us to reason about um, growth uh, in CPU and memory allocation um, because memory is usually the, the dominant resource. Um, yeah, so next I think I'm gonna try and give you an overview of the actual logic used by each policy itself. Um, uh, so for example, for memory, uh, what we will end up relying on in terms of metrics are memory utilization metrics for native and key memory utilization. Uh, we're also now uh, looking at uh, garbage collection metrics such as time taken for garbage collection, how frequently it runs, um, at the same time failure rates and out of memory exceptions. Uh, for CPU, we look at you know, obviously CPU uh, utilization. Um, since some of our clusters are also heterogeneous, so we look at number of cores per machine. I also try and look at clock speed because some no two cores may be equal if their clock speeds are different. Uh, also, uh, depending on the hypothetical configuration, uh, CPU allocation may mean different things, which is uh, two machines may have completely different number of cores, um, but 10% CPU on each means uh, you know, different things. Um, in terms of uh, increase itself, uh, most of the policies use like a multiplicative increase. This is just to minimize the amount of time taken. Uh, but we found is for some sort of brand new jobs entering the system, this is uh, sometimes not quick enough. So there, what we've done is we've added an optimization where um, rather than just doing a blanket uh, multiplicative increase from the scra from scratch, uh, we uh, kind of figure out what is the average expected QPS for the job uh, on um, by querying its input uh, metrics or input uh, statistics, such as uh, message in rate, byte in rate, um, and for all its input, and then we apply sort of a simple empirical model that gives us some baseline size. So that uh, rather than uh, uh, rather than we waiting uh, sort of mul many multiplicative steps for it to go from you know the number of containers one number of one container to sixteen, baseline size would optimize some of these steps away so to further kind of take away the uh, the time taken. Um, and yeah, so next uh, also comes the question of uh, scaling parallelism. How do we? Uh, you have a job that is stalling. How do you measure parallelism? How do you measure its impact? And how do you then scale things up? Um, so what we've tried to do here is um, we have a container or a JVM or some job that's processing input. Um, it's obviously checkpointing its input because uh, in case it fails, and that's the checkpoint it'll recover to, recover from. Um, and so what we have is a separate service that computes a diff between the last known checkpoint and the tail of the input topic. Uh, which gives us a good measure uh, called lag in terms of uh, the job. So uh, similarly, we, it allows us to calculate what is the current catch-up rate of the job and the catch-up time of the job. And the nice thing about this is this being a completely independent uh, service uh, doesn't rely on the job's health itself. 
meaning uh, meaning if even if the job is completely down or stalling or stuck in the weird GC pauses, we would still be able to calculate and observe its status. Right? Um, so for example, for a stalling job, you would see uh, this metric or this lag or backlog increasing like so. Um, and so, yeah, so the policy here does something very simple. All it does is scale up the scale up the job when it's not keeping up with input, which means we're not necessarily scaling it up when the lag has breached a certain threshold, but we're um, scaling it up when it's increasing or when it's trending up like so. Um, and so to do that, uh, that is an interesting problem to solve by itself. Um, so what we've done is we've Try to apply a few different heuristics um, to detect such patterns, essentially detect such trends. Um, this includes your regression, bucketing. Bucketing basically means you bucket these events into certain time events. So an average every five minutes or every 10 minutes and then apply a simple regression on top. While a usual regression would just do a curve fitting uh, of a single or a binomial or quadrilateral um, on top of this. Um, and what we find is as compared to a threshold based approach, this is much more useful in practice because this means every action is interpretable. And, uh, essentially every action is, inter is backed by a graph where uh, things were trending up in terms of lag. Um, as, as, and then this gives us a nice meaning to the aggressiveness or passiveness of the controller because now we can say a given scale up action was taken because, we, because I found that um, this job had increasing lag for a duration of X minutes. Uh, that allows us to easily map that information to uh, job cost to serve, uh, job priority, um, as compared to just a threshold based approach uh, on that, that's based on perhaps lag, right? Um, and so, yeah, so that's how scale up works uh, for, uh, for the regular case. And then in case of jobs that are talking to remote services, the story is a bit more interesting uh, because now uh, in order to process a message, a job may be reaching out to a key value store like Espresso or Venice, or maybe reaching out to a web service or a couch based cache. Um, and so here, therefore, uh, what we need is we need to know uh, is if it's safe to scale up a job and what level is it safe to scale it up to. Um, and so what we do here is SAMHSA provides users in their SDK with an API called Table API, which allows them to specify, um, or which allows them to read and write uh, from these remote sources pretty easily um, and allows them to specify what are some remote provision QPS limits that they want. Um, this becomes useful because Oftentimes the remote service is also serving other uh, services. And uh, we typically some code as sort of sharing those resources between this computation and other ones. Um, and so because we now have provision limits, um, this, the auto sizer can then uh, basically base its scaling up decisions based on the fact if the limit is uh, pretty close to being breached or already been breached, in which case it initiates a scale down. Um, but yeah, so that's in the very basic case of how that's how it works. Now, another case um, here is when you have uh, the latency for a given job, uh, for a given remote service that goes up. So for example, assume if processing a single message used to take a millisecond, um, a job can then for every message um, uh, exp expend a millisecond and uh, process that message. Suddenly if that latency rises to 10 milliseconds, uh, the jobs processing throughput will now uh, scale up, uh, slow up. Um, and so that leaves us with an interesting case on like what happens if the latency or the error rate of the remote service surges. So this is something we're still working on. Uh, what we're looking at is uh, ways to correlate uh, remote service latency with job throughput uh, programmatically. Um, and then based on that adjust the auto sizer behavior. But yeah, more on that, I guess later. Um, at the same time, we have jobs that do stateful processing. So what that means is, uh, like I said, um, jobs have uh, sort of containers. They are maintaining some RocksDB state locally, which is back into remote stores like Kafka, Embry, Espresso, and so on. Um, this is typically useful for jobs that do, say, joins between different inputs. Um, they're buffering input for something, deduping. Um, and so the way Autosizer works uh, here is, 
it divides the the processing of these um, or the processing life cycle of these jobs into two stages one is when they are they have just started up and are restoring state um, and are actually not processing input and second when they are actually have restored state and so all the artificer needs to do then is essentially uh, figure out if the job is not processing because it is restoring state and coming to a consistent state before it begins processing in that case it essentially pauses up all the sizing actions other than that i in the steady state uh, the scaling looks fairly similar um and moving on to scaling down um here um we are what we've tried to do is we've tried to build a controller that does a single step scale down unlike an additive decrease um that's because we just want to minimize the amount of flux and amount of sizing actions in the system because most sizing actions can be fairly disruptive uh, in java if you have to decrease the heap size uh, of a jvm you actually have to pause you have to kill it and start a brand new one so what we've tried to do is is actually uh, minimize that um and so what we so the way we scale on memory for example is uh, we obviously look at the total memory usage um but we also look at some specific java metrics like heap used heap committed uh, heap committed is a java metric that uh, gives you java's estimate of the amount of heap it thinks that the jvm requires um and we combine that with some of the zero page optimizations that a kernel makes um uh, to uh, while allocating memory and so what that does is then allows us to decrease both container memory as well as container count uh, in one step uh, by right sizing and with, while an additive decrease we're basically uh, decreasing by x percent and guessing if it's it's good enough kind of like how tcp does it um and then for cpu it's fairly simple as well uh, we mostly just look at uh, percentage used cpu and then based and then taking into account the uh, heterogeneity in the hardware um we um essentially change the cpu allocation for a given jvm uh, we haven't found a need to actually do uh, change the number of jvms uh, because at that point it starts being a point of sort of diminishing return um same thing for uh, parallelism um, the way we measure uh, the way we do this is we basically measure the thread pool utilization for every container um and uh, we issue scale down actions only when we know that a uh, scale down action um, is required that would produce a decrease in the number of jvms or number of containers uh, because just taking away threads usually means you're taking away uh, just a very small amount of memory in idle memory and idle cpu uh, which is uh, a fairly diminishing return um again uh, having a single step here kind of sort of comes in handy versus as compared to a additive decrease approach um and yeah one last uh, or one other interesting uh, uh aspect here is we've implemented this auto sizer as a stateful sample job itself running on the same cluster uh it uses the rocksdb stores that i just described to maintain all the metadata that uh, that is needed for the auto sizing decisions um and we've used some of the samza features that allow um, us to run a sam this samza job uh, this auto sizer samza job which is consuming data from all the other samza jobs in the cluster um today yeah it runs at about half a gig of memory which caters to uh, hundreds of production jobs uh, so we'll uh, give gives the scalability by just sharding up just like we would shard up a regular stream processing samza job um yeah we've rolled it out to production uh in terms of uh, some recent results we've seen cluster memory use drop by about 40 45% uh with little change in throughput and latency um we've cut uh, over provisioning but kept it bound at 10% level uh similarly by right sizing cpu what we've seen is we can benefit from we get a almost 10% statistical multiplexing benefit because now we're not sizing everybody to peaks so we're sizing them up and sizing them down controllably uh similarly uh for brand new jobs is uh where we've seen uh quite a lot of benefit because now uh our users or developers or data scientists don't have to spend uh, any time doing uh manual tuning or adjusting of the jobs uh, different resource sizing parameters um so that manual effort which is typically at least a few man hours per job it, it is zero essentially um it could review from users um the next what i thought i'd do is talk about some of the lessons learned in in, in doing this um what we found is recording all the sizing decisions that our auto sizer has taken um 
uh, in sort of a durable you know, OLAP table or store itself has helped quite a bit. Um, even though we do have sort of traditional metrics, but having this kind of audit log usually helps not just to um, just query and figure out if there are patterns, but also during adjusting or rolling out of new algorithms, it allows us to sort of handle and run some analytics and figure out the actual impact uh, in, in, in a variety of different ways. Um, at the same time, uh, we've added, I would uh, add safeguards that uh, that limit how how bad or a job can be scaled up to similarly limits on how uh, how far up a given container or JVM can be less scaled up to, uh, as well as uh, when things get close to cluster capacity. Um, this uh, basically allows us to sort of have a, a autosizer yet be involved in terms of uh, when decisions are getting close to capacity or uh, human intervention is required. Um, at the same time, because our Autosizer structure is very policy-based in nature, like I described. It allows us to turn off certain policies and certain jobs when it's not desired. Um, and so that has allowed us to sort of do a safe uh, tuning or safe rollout uh, by tuning things selectively. Um, but yeah, at the same time, we have a few open problems that we're still working on. Um, so we've figured out that there is a Java GC hysteresis problem. What that means is Today, if a stream processing JVM runs long enough, um, Java will optimize its heap. So essentially the longer a JVM runs, the smaller its heap. Um, and at that point, it may seem well worth to resize it, by, but resizing will require, uh, resizing will require restarting it. Um, and when you restart it, it may actually then, because now it's not been running a long time, it may actually require more heap. Um, so what that leads to is this kind of hysteresis behavior that you may see. Um, and so what we are trying to uh, figure out is our uh, ways to navigate this memory Java GC CPU trade-off uh, or memory, uh, yeah, memory trade-off um, for, for such scenarios. Uh, similarly, another one, another sort of uh, problem we've discovered is uh, essentially memory and CPU is a trade-off for many Java applications because you can run with one gig of heat with certain CPU size, you can run with half a giga heap with more CPU. Um, and so how do you sort of navigate the spectrum? Um, at the same time, uh, today our artists cannot differentiate a job requiring memory uh, for valid purposes versus jobs that just bug memory leaks. Um, and so we are trying to figure out automated mechanisms to detect those. Um, at the same time, we've, uh, we were trying to invest in uh, detecting, uh, having better trend detection that's not only more accurate in terms of detecting uh, sort of valid scale up or uh, valid trending up uh, lag values, but also lightweight because we presumably want to uh, run and scale the control itself. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that's mostly all I had uh, to conclude. Um, yeah, resource sizing is pretty crucial, and pretty time consuming. If you have to do it manually, it's very cumbersome and you're always susceptible to over or under provisioning. None of those are ideal. Um, and streaming process, stream processing jobs are fairly complex. They have all kinds of workloads, all kinds of functionalities. Um, and resource sizing under the, this kind of uh, heterogeneity basically means you're trying to trade run a trade off between resource use, performance, cost, operability. Um, so what we've tried to build here is basically a rule based approach to navigate these trade offs uh, for production. Um, we have a paper out uh, at Music Thought Cloud last year. Uh, which is um, we uh, which is essentially the initial nascent idea for this it talks about some of these trade-offs. Uh, we also have a patent, um, and then we have a couple of publications in flight that will hopefully land soon. But yeah, that's mostly all I had. Thanks, Ray. Um, there's been a number of questions in the uh, chat, but uh, these things been answering them as we go. So I, I don't know if there's Perfect. actually any outstanding questions. Um, if there are more questions, uh, definitely please feel free to post them in the chat. I definitely encourage folks to scroll back uh, to the chat. There's a couple of good questions in there. And that that uh, paper that, that Ray just mentioned is right at the very end there. So that's, that's there.
All right, well, maybe uh, don't see any questions coming in. Um, F.A., do you think uh, anything else we should do or should we? Uh... Yeah, I think uh, we can wrap up. Uh, so thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, and especially during this holiday season. Uh, thanks, thank you, uh, everyone. And uh, I'd like to thank our speakers for the great talks. Yeah. And see you next time in our next meetup. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.